talk, uh, as Andy said, is uh, about uh, how we are expanding the, the target languages, the, the backends that uh, Cyclone has available. Uh, although uh, so, some of them are, uh, are already available, uh, and some of the things I'm going to talk about, it's uh, road plans to things that are going to be available in the future. So uh, for this talk, I'll use uh, Cyclone Bench. Uh, I don't know if you've heard uh, about it yet, but uh, basically it's uh, different benchmarks that we have uh, open sourced in, in this uh, GitHub repository. It's a uh, dash FTFC dash Cyclone Bench. Uh, and there is essentially three benchmarks. Uh, Nemo Light 2D, uh, which is a, a vertically leveraged version of uh, Nemo, uh, and maybe a bit uh, confusing is that uh, it uses the GeoCell uh, API, not the Nemo API in this case. Uh, then we have a uh, shallow water, which uh, also uses the GeoCell, and it's a code that comes from uh, NCAR. Uh, and then we have uh, an Afric small vector multiplication benchmark, si uh, very similar to uh, one of the main uh, bottleneck kernels in Afric. Uh, in this talk, uh, I will uh, just talk about uh, Nemo Light 2D. It's the first one. Uh, and this is uh, very interesting because, uh, as I said, we have a version of uh, Nemo Light 2D that uh, is written in the GeoEngine DSL. So Cyclone can, can read, uh, understand this, and, and generate code in all of these uh, its backends. But in addition, we also have uh, manual uh, implementations in a lot of uh, programming languages and, and uh, parallel programming models, uh, including uh, different Fortran, C++, uh, OpenCL, and Region. Uh, I will start with uh, the Fortran. Uh, probably that's what you have uh, all been doing during the, the hands-on. Uh, the, the first thing I want to show is that, uh, yeah, we, we can do OpenMP and MPI uh, eff effectively. Maybe the, the only caveat here is that uh, to get good performance or performance comparable to manual implementations, I found that uh, it's always essential to at least apply the inline transformation. And this is because uh, the, the model, the, this uh, separation of the kernel from the algorithm uh, makes uh, Cyclone write the kernels as just the inner part of, uh, of the loop. That's what you call the kernel. And in uh, some applications like GeoEngine, that they don't include uh, loops or ita iterations inside the kernel, it can be very expensive if there is a function call for every every single uh, kernel that that you execute. Uh, however, when the module inline uh, implement uh, transformation is applied, uh, at least in the serial OpenMP and MPI we get as good performance as the manual implementation. Uh, also, the, the second plot shows that uh, the MPI uh, has some reasonable uh, scalability uh, that depends in a lot of factors, of course, like the, the problem size and, and uh, other factors, how many uh, synchronizations there are. Uh, but in this case, I, I'm just plotting the weak scalability. This means uh, I keep increasing the, the problem size uh, in proportion to the number of runs, or said in another way, I'm, I'm keeping the uh, workload of a single node or a single core, uh, core constant. Uh, therefore, we expect this uh, the, the time per step to be horizontal in this uh, plot. And this happens roughly uh, until uh, 1,000 MPI runs. Uh, where we get 86% uh, parallel efficiency. I would say that's very good. But after that, we, we start losing uh, parallel efficiency. So, okay, uh, that's what Cyclone uh, can do. And, and uh, the, the Fortran backends are quite mature and, and we know they work. But uh, one maybe we would want to ask, uh, is this going to be enough for, for extra scale or even for the current uh, Prexa scale uh, computers. And if we look at the top 500 list, specifically the, the top five ones or the, the fastest ones, uh, we see that uh, just 
uh, well, uh, since recently the, the top one uh, can be uh, used just with uh, op OpenMP and MPI because it's uh, uh, distributed multi-core uh, processors. However, most of the fastest computers have some kind of accelerator. Uh, Sumit and Sierra have uh, NVIDIA V100 GPUs and the Chinese have uh, some uh, specific accelerators. So maybe Fortran uh, will be uh, difficult to, to target those. Uh, also, that, that's not just a specific on this case. We know that uh, upcoming supercomputers will have Intel and AMD GPUs, like the American Aurora and Frontier. And maybe longer term in the future, some people are exploring FPGA or RISC-5 uh, solutions. And it's uh, reasonable to assume that Fortran will not be the prim primary target. So uh, this question comes, is Fortran going to be a, enough just with the directives? Uh, so in Cyclone, we allow to, to use Fortran with open ACC. Uh, you probably seen examples of, of this, uh, but that's still directives. But uh, we see at the same time that the vendors are spending a lot of resources in improving their own uh, software stacks, like uh, NVIDIA is, is developing CUDA, AMD is developing this Rockem and HIPS, uh, and Intel has started investing heavily in uh, SQL through their uh, One API initiative. Uh, at the same time, we can also see uh, the US has the Exascale computing project uh, where they are porting a lot of their applications to the uh, COCOS programming model. So th there is a lot of investment in, in these uh, new uh, programming technologies which are not based on Fortran. Uh, and maybe we, we want to, to leverage all, all these uh, software stacks. So uh, for the reason, already a couple of years ago, we started going towards this uh, vision that uh, the CIR should be uh, as language independent as possible. And this would allow us to uh, not just target Fortran, but uh, from the same science code, try to uh, target different backends. Uh, and uh, as I said in the previous presentation, this has been funded by some European projects and by internal funding from UKRI. Uh, and I will discuss some, some of these projects uh, now in this talk. So uh, the, the one that we started with uh, as an example of that uh, was OpenCL. Uh, and the idea here was uh, to, to use Nimulite 2D with, with its uh, Fortran algorithm definition and, and its Fortran kernel definition to be parsed by Cyclone. And Cyclone should generate uh, OpenCL code. Uh, this ha OpenCL has two advantages. One is that uh, maybe it's not the preferred of any vendor, but all of the vendors support it. So you can run OpenCL in uh, NVIDIA, AMDs, uh, Intel CPUs, FPGAs. So it, it has... Uh, quite a broad set of uh, target ar architectures. And the second advantage, as you can see in this diagram, is that really the, the only part that you really need to translate into OpenCL are the computational kernels. The rest of uh, the algorithm and the parallel system layers can still be Fortran. They just need to call the OpenCL uh, runtime. And we do that through uh, Fortran bindings to OpenCL. Uh, in a library called ForCL that uh, we also have open source it in GitHub. That's uh, GitHub uh, slash uh, STFC slash uh, ForCL. Uh, so just with this, uh, I'm translating the, the kernels, uh, which is uh, easier than translating the rest of the code because the kernels are usually just arithmetic and, and data accesses. Uh, we can already target uh, OpenCL. And here's an example of uh, current uh, code, uh, the Nimolite 2D code. Uh, in the left part of this slide, you have the, the Cyclone script that uh, I'm currently using to translate to OpenCL. You can see that it's relatively simple. Basically, uh, I need to apply two transformations. One of them is this uh, kernel to globals arguments. This is because uh, in OpenCL, you cannot 
have uh, globals uh, inside the kernels, or, or at least globals that you might also write uh, from the parallel system layer. So the first thing you need is to get rid uh, in all the kernels, I'm doing this in, in this loop, of any global arg uh, any globals and translate them into function arguments. And the second thing that I'm doing is applying the OCL trans transformation to the whole schedule. Uh, at, what we do is we uh, we transform uh, whole invoke schedules into OpenCL, not uh, separate kernels. Uh, that's enough to translate to OpenCL. However, it's very useful to do a third thing, thing which is uh, set some local size. Uh, in OpenCL, the local size is the number of uh, data parallel uh, threads, if, if you will, that uh, will be executed in the same uh, CUDA core or in the same uh, uh, AMD core uh, at the same time. This is how uh, GPUs get the parallelism usually. And this might depend uh, on what uh, architecture are you, but uh, 64 has turned out to be a good number in, in most of the architectures. So that last step is, as I said, necessary just for performance. So this a script. Uh, I just uh, executed it this way. So in Cyclone calls uh, Nimolite to the uh, Fortran code with this transformation script. And in the right-hand side, you can see the, the results I'm, I'm getting. Uh, here, I'm comparing the uh, Cyclone auto-generating OpenCL against a manual implementation of the same code using OpenAC. And I'm also adding the, the roofline boundary uh, of uh, uh, memory, of the bandwidth. Uh, uh, probably you, you know about the, the roofline model. It's a way to know uh, if the performance you are getting from a code is maybe good enough, or, or at least to give uh, some context of it, if it should be better. And it does that considering two ceilings or uh, two saturation points. One is uh, the saturation of uh, your code is using all the computational resources available in the CPU. And the other ceiling is uh, uh, your code is using or saturating all the memory bandwidth. For Nimolite 2D, uh, we know it's uh, bandwidth bound. It means it will saturate the memory bandwidth uh, first uh, than the computational uh, resources of the CPU. This is why here I just plotted the, the memory bandwidth uh, line. So you can see it's it's not perfect. Maybe there's a scope to add uh, more optimizations, but we are at the moment like saturating 60% of the memory bandwidth. So so it's a reasonable use of the GPU resources in this case. So that that's uh, what, what's working right now. This is available in, in Cyclone Master. But we are uh, doing more work on that, uh, specifically uh, in two projects. One is Euroexa. It's an European project that uh, targets FPGAs. And we are using OpenCL to target FPGAs. But uh, OpenCL for FPGAs is substantially different than the one you write for GPUs. Uh, that the parallelism model is a bit different, and you can add uh, vendor-specific pragmas to try to improve it. Uh, and then we have a collaboration with the ECP, the Exascale Computing Project in the US, in order to find opportunities to uh, integrate their solutions uh, and our solutions together. So I'm going to go through these two projects uh, quickly. Uh, I just have one slide about Euroexa. Uh, basically, uh, for FPGAs uh, at the moment, Cyclone can target FPGAs. Uh, we can produce uh, OpenCL code that can run if you have the patience to, to wait for the long compilation time in FPGAs. However, the performance is not yet uh, competitive to uh, CPU, state-of-art CPUs and GPUs. And this is partially because uh, at the moment we still don't have a good utilization of the whole FPGA device. We are maybe just utilizing 20 or 20 percent of the whole device. Uh, to solve that, uh, in the future, I'm, I'm going to try to expose more parallelism in the OpenCL code. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is uh, using OpenCL tasks instead of uh, ND ranges. I don't know if you are familiar to OpenCL, but it's a way to uh, 
uh, explicitly put your uh, iteration loops inside the kernels so then uh, you can uh, work with them uh, and maybe the, that, that could benefit the FPGA where you might not want to do all of them in data parallel, you may also want to use uh, some pipe lightning of, of your execution. So that may be a possibility. Another thing that we are improving is that uh, EuroX is going to target uh, distributed FPGAs, uh, like multiple node uh, architecture. And we are going to release that very soon, the multi-FPGA executions by a combination of MPI and OpenCL. Uh, the second project, the collaboration with uh, ECP, we have several objectives in this project. What is uh, one is to uh, study if we can integrate some of the ECP's technologies uh, into Cyclone, and particularly we are looking to integrate the Cocos programming model as uh, an additional backend. Uh, but then uh, we we are also have made available Cyclone in the SPAC uh, package manager uh, from the ECP, and we uh, share uh this knowledge and, and best practices with some of the ecp partners so uh this work with uh cocos that there are several ways we can integrate cocos into cyclone uh, i tried two of them which are marked in orange here one is to fully integrate cocos this means uh, we adopt the way of uh, laying out things in memory uh specifically they have a, a container called view that uh, uh, you can specify in which memory space this container lives. The problem with this, this way to integrate things is that we end up with a, a data duplication. We have the same information in the Fortran array and in the views, so, so it takes twice the memory. Uh, however, with this, we can, all, we, we can use all the Cocos functionality. So it, it's a good way to explore uh, what Cocos ca can offer. Then in the opposite side of the spectrum, in the bottom of this presentation, uh, there's a second approach i taken, which is uh, don't let Cocos use their own data structure, but uh, let Cocos just work with the raw pointers that uh, are on, on top or are the same data than the Fortran arrays. Uh, with this, we can still use parts of Cocos, especially the, the parallel execution model. However, we lose some of their nice features about uh, data layout abstraction uh, and automatic device acceleration. There is a third option, uh, which is here in the model, which uh, maybe it's an in-between the two, where we, uh, we still are in charge of the data layout, but we can make the views overlap with this data. Uh, I've still not, not explored this third middle option. Uh, and for, for Cocos and uh, in general for C++ frameworks, we are, we're also thinking about the uh, SQL here. It's uh, the, the one API, if somebody's familiar with that. Uh, it's slightly different than OpenCL in the sense that uh, we don't only need to port the kernels to the target language, but also part of the parallel, uh, uh, parallel system layer needs to be ported into the target language because it's also in charge of uh, scheduling things into the acceleration devices. So the idea here is that uh, we divide the parallel system layers in two bits. One, that uh, it still offers all the, the Fortran uh, entry points and the Fortran calls to the libraries that uh, maybe exist in the algorithm because we, we still need those. But then uh, when all of this information is collected, we transform all of this into rank pointers and function wrappers uh, and do the call and the translation into the uh, C++ domain, in this case, using Cocos. Uh, and I've made a manual implementation of, of this already. Uh, it's not fully automatic by Cyclone, but this is the, the target or the, the, what we intend to do uh, by, by Cyclone in the future. Uh, there is an, another um, consideration here is that uh, the, the parallel system layer uh, might not know if some data is going to be used outside its scope. So uh, in general, or, or the, the first thing that I did was uh, the parallel system would copy all its data into the device, do the computation, and then copy all its data back uh, in what I'm calling a preventive copy. Uh, 
but then I realized that a lot of time this data that I was copying back in, into the host uh, was not even used. Uh, this I, I'm showing here with uh, two regions in the algorithm. One that maybe uh, the field is not accessed after the region, and a second one where the field is, is accessed. So these preventive data copies are really unnecessary. So I try to thought in a way to to improve this, and uh, we came up uh, with this idea of uh, don't copy the data back uh, after the uh, sign layer. Instead, give the field instructions about how to get the the data back. Uh, in the case it, need, it needs it. Uh, so here uh, you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Let me show the, the last. Uh, instead of, of bringing the data back at the end of the, the side layer, we just assign a, a function pointer to a, the get element method, and uh, which can be called from Fortran. Uh, and then uh, in the Fortran uh, part, uh, when the field access an element, we we will have the instructions about how to, how to retrieve this data. This, uh, in my experiments, uh, has a much better performance. It avoids a lot of synchronization. Uh, but you can see that we do the data copy at the last moment. Maybe we can refine this a little bit more uh, and try to uh, overlap computation and communication. Uh, that's something we can do in the future. Uh, so this is the results I'm getting with uh, Cocos compared uh, with other manual implementations. You can see that uh, Cocos is the uh, can target all uh, the architectures that we are considering at the moment. Here we have uh, Intel CPU and AMD CPU, the left part, the two leftmost uh, plots, and then uh, Nvidia GPUs and AMD GPUs. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the results are proportional to the memory bank within it, in, in each architecture in all but the AMD GPUs. However, to, to be fair to the AMD GPUs, uh, I am not developing in them. I just got access to one of them and tried how good it was. Uh, so maybe if I spend more development time in the AMD GPUs, it could also get better. Uh, the second thing to notice is that uh, there is some variation between them. And uh, interestingly, uh, in each platform, we get the best performance uh, with a different programming model uh, that just shows you how difficult the uh, performance portability can be. So uh, for instance, in the Intel CPUs, uh, we get the best performance with uh, the draw pointers, Cocos implementations. In the AMD with uh, C++ and uh, OpenMP, uh, and in uh, NVIDIA uh, GPUs, we get the best performance using the Fortran OpenAC, and finally in AMD GPUs with the OpenCL. So there's a lot of possibilities and a lot of uh, exploration space. Uh, and I think this is a, a good thing or, or a good reason to use Cyclone because it's uh, a lot of work to start writing the physics uh, independent, independently for each programming model and, and parallel system model. Uh, it's much easier uh, if, if Cyclone under the hood can translate uh, them to the target system uh, and just optimize or, or apply optimizations specifically target to that one specific system. So uh, that's the, the end of the presentation. The, the uh, summary is that uh, especially if we look at the uh, pre excess scale supercomputers, we can see an increasingly heterogeneous hardware landscape. And with this heterogeneous hardware landscape comes an uh, heterogeneous software ecosystem. So it will be good if we can make use of, of uh, a broad uh, amount of, of this ecosystem. Currently, Cyclone can, can support CPU and GPU computing, and we are developing basic support for FPGA computing. And also, we have we have started some initial work in supporting uh, C++ programming models like Cocos and SQL. Uh, these are not ready yet, but it's part of our uh, roadmap to to have uh, some level of support for for these programming models. Uh, and that's the end of, of my presentation. I will be happy to take questions now. Uh, and yeah, just to mention again that uh, Cyclone is open source, and all the the 
benchmarks that I shown in this presentation are also open source in the Cyclone Bench uh, repository. 